Hello. Hi, right, so I, I was waiting for Marty. I really wanted to get going a little bit early, but he is dealing with the debacle of dinner showing up early. I know, it's terrible, I don't know what we're gonna do. Um, but he's figuring that out, he'll get it in here, we'll have dinner, yay. Uh, I did want him here because a part, and, and I'm sure he will be joining us, but I thought that when we start today, first of all, it's gonna be about co-assessing, that'll be the majority of what we're talking about today. And I hope everybody, the, the link that we have, whoops, the, um, the Wi-Fi, if you're looking for Wi-Fi, it's the same as last time, I don't actually know if that's the exact one, but if you linked in last time, you should be linked in again today. Um, in terms of our agenda, welcome, so check, we're welcomed. But today, a bunch of you were able to come and visit Granada Hills and visit co-teachers who are uh, in classes actually teaching. And so I want us to do a little bit of a debrief on that, both from the perspective of those of you Granada Hills co-teachers who welcomed people to your classroom, who let people observe you, you can debrief on did the, did the lesson go the way you wanted it to, did it not, why, and what kind of planning took place, what kind of approaches did you use in your co-instruction, did you do any co-assessment, but also those of you who observed, what did you take away from it, what are some things that you want to keep doing in your own classes. I already heard a couple of you say to Granada people, you guys are welcome to come and observe us too, and I love that because that's what this community of practice is about. It's about us just continuously learning from each other, seeing what's really happening in high schools in this area with our kids and continuing to build. So I think that that's really important and I wanted to be able for us to spend a little bit of time debriefing on that. Um, also, we'll be going into the co-assessing stuff. The other thing is that on April 26th, so write that down somewhere, on April 26th, that's the next time. We're not doing any more evening sessions, this is it. This is our, our last day together, except for April 26th is the last summit. And the, um, I think the, the plan is those of you who can come, uh, come and observe again, and then right afterwards they wanna get together, debrief, maybe do a panel, do a Q&A, something again to keep pulling this all together. So that's the next day that is on the books for this. Um, before I go on to continue to talk about, uh, before we talk about how we are going to continue as a community of practice, let's just spend a little bit of time about today. What are some things that you saw, or again, those of you who were kind enough to open your classes and have people come in and observe, you know, what was going on? Let's share. I want to know. I wasn't able to come today, but I do understand that blue ribbon people were here today to also see the co-teaching. So, gold, gold ribbon, gold, not blue, gold, even better. <laughs> Different, yeah, blue, gold, and it'll be purple or whatever. Okay, so gold ribbon people were here today. So yeah, we just started because I needed to get us going. Um, but I'm asking for people to share what they did in classes, how they, if, if it was Granada people like yourself, how you guys prepared, what did you do for your uh, lesson today, what worked, what didn't, and just general discussion. Let's let's share. Thank you. Good. Wait, wait, let's do this because again we're trying to make sure we have everybody here. Alright, All right. I, um, well, my group saw the biology lesson and the government lesson. And I want to talk about the biology lesson a little bit because um, I've got a lot of strategies. I'm going to turn into the coach. So oh. I've got a lot of strategies from this group, just how, how they got attention and things that, you know, you wouldn't really like to think about. But they just brought it to my thing. I have eight percent um look way for resident. That, you know, high school students have residents. I have eighty percent of the rest of hundred percent, you know what I'm saying. Um, another one was as particular season of eighth grade, I could hear work in eighth grade. And man like, what? What are you talking about? <laughs> and so <laughs> So um That's that cool. was interesting. And another thing was I like the flow of the classroom. They had a science experiment, and it was something that got the kids really engaged in the lesson, and it kept them like just involved and engaged. And me and my own partner was saying, "No one had their cell phones." Like, uh -huh. We used to see in high school just on their cell phones. It was not one student on their cell phone, and both groups. So um, that was what I got from the lesson. So that's a good 
That's awesome. Thank you. And so today is about co-assessing. I'm just going to link that. That's an assessment. How do we know kids are engaged? Not one kid was on their cell phone. Right? You could collect data on that. That's pretty cool. And I like that you said you also got specific concrete strategies about flow and about the actual instruction of what they were doing, how they were keeping kids, stuff like that. That's great. Give me some others. What else was going on? This is about sharing. Please do. Yeah. Hey. Thanks. Um, I observed the uh, US history class and the number one class. Um, for both classes, what I noticed was um, uh, the two co teachers were seamlessly transitioning between each other. Um, in our class, I think um, uh, Saul would ask a question and then the student would respond, and then the Sarshan would well, reply to that response, and then she would ask a question, and then well, they would just go back and forth. And then in um, uh, this year class, they broke the class into groups, and they were just going between two groups like, without any um, problems. Nice. Yeah, and that, that's not easy, right? Transitioning takes a little bit of time, and it takes a comfort level with your partner. So the fact that you said seamlessly transition means they've, they've been doing this. They've been working on this, so that's great. What else? And remember, we want to hear from Granada, too, about what you guys were doing. What, what did it take to put on these lessons? Was it a dog and pony show, or was it what you usually do? <laughs> Please do. Okay, so I'm fortunate to have two great teachers. I have a, uh, I teach world history, it's called the uh, uh, Big History Project, and then I can teach also, co teach with the, the teach U.S. History, both of them are awesome. Um, when I talk about our uh, LB, uh, Big History Project, what we did was we had them um, at first get into their what we call LBH groups, and they had to build a project that they go into the new project. <coughs> Year, a project that came up through all the way through the semester. So we're breaking it down into sections. So they had a section that they had to complete. Then we transitioned to uh, Adobe Spark. We wanted, in, in this Adobe Spark, uh, they had to do a uh, small meeting. And so we introduced one of the small meetings that they wanted to use. So we introduced them to Adobe Spark and had them actually create five slides. Uh, actually talk about big history. So if you were going to another country and somebody was like, what are you doing? And say, oh, okay, look at the slides, what our class does, and they kind of do some big history. And then in a US history class, what we do, we're reading um, Raisin and Sun. So every you know, every other day or every day so far, and then we break it down every other day, they read 10 minutes, and then they have to reflect. So silent reading for 10 minutes, we have book class books, and it's the plot. And then we're going to show it afterwards because we're doing civil, civil rights this, this last um, minute. Then after that, they have a, a civil rights mini project where they, were given, where they uh, were given a chance to pick uh, 32 items, between 32 items, you know, like Rosa Parks, Montgomery Bus, uh, Boycott, Freedom Summer. And they have to do an Adobe Spark or another adult media, Adobe Spark or Prezi. And introduce that. And they have certain slides they have to do, so the parents and the other people do it. So they do the parents by themselves. So what we was doing was we took the people that were doing it by themselves and made sure they were on track and understand. And then a uh, group of people that we felt that were might be our most uh, learners and made sure that they were transitioning, not just sitting there staring in the space and stuff like, oh my God, because they don't like reason they didn't ask questions. So, we moved around the room and did that like that, so. That's great. So, it's another form of so, assessment yeah. on our way. Exactly. Yeah, there's assessment there. You mentioned technology. You had different forms of engagement, so multiple means of representation and engagement, uh, which is universal design for learning. Um, I like that you thought in advance about your different learners, that some of them are going to be able to get going on the Adobe Spark or whatever, and then others are going to need more support. So you have all that. Now, I have a quick question for you, though. Stron, you mentioned that you have these two different people with whom you co-teach. Yes. So, how does that work in terms of, do you have, yeah, co-planning? Is it, do you feel like you have the same amount for both? Do you not have enough for either? Do you have more for one than the other? Have you been working with one longer 
How's that working with partnerships? Because that's always a question of too many partners. Yeah. Yes. Um, no, I mean, it's, 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 it's
that it doesn't feel like you have a set role, but you guys are both willing to do that. Great. Others. With some more people, but who saw some classes today? Yes. Again, or those of you who did did teach can talk about what went into it. Um, so I observed today. I observed this history class, and I observed their geology class for a little while. Um, uh, I'm impressed with the school overall. The fact that you guys have the technology for it. Your students have phone book is amazing. I want to find out how you did that. What grant you wrote? And when you speak to about that, um, <laughs> I also was introduced to the big uh, history um, project. It's called. Um, which is really, really cool, and there's functions on there that adjust the reading level for students. Um, it changes the lexile level, and it's just a click away, and a student doesn't have to share that with the class. It can be a very um, personal thing. Um, I wish I could have seen that Spark project. I wanted to actually watch the kids do it, but it sounds exciting, and I'm going to check it out. And in the geometry class, I had to step out, but um, I, I really couldn't tell. I still, do I still don't know who's the special educator and who's the general educator. I really have no idea. Yay. That's great. So right away, one of the things you noticed was the use of technology and the differentiation and the fact that it wasn't something that had to be a big deal. It was just right there and they were able to make use of it. That's fantastic. I don't need the microphone. We just tell the kids. We it's because care. it's the um, okay. recording. We, we tell the kids when we switch the Lexile levels that we honestly don't care which one you read. And we make it a point to let them know that if you want to read the 670, it's the same exact information. And so we kind of let all the that's kids nice. figure out which one they want to read. And then so there's really no stigma. Video. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. Love that. I love that. And just, you know, I, a lot of times if you have been taught about differentiation, a lot of times what people will first say is, you know, you kind of, you make it surreptitious, like you just do this so nobody has to know. And so you can't do that all the time. And plus, kids are really smart. They're just going to look over like, well, she's doing something different. So sometimes just being really upfront of different people have different things in here. Mm -hmm. Fair does not mean equal. Suck it up or however you want to say it, you know, but that's, it's fine because that's what we do in life, right? There are sometimes you're interested in something and you will read the most complex task. Uh, text and other times you either don't care or you don't have time and you are skimming or you want the thing that's the bulleted cliff notes and that's that's fair for us as adults too so so what do you explain that like a little bit more because I've been I myself I've been asking the students to read the supplemental book and then read the textbook which they're annoyed that they have more work because it has missing information I just don't know how to change this left side is that something you can hear? Here. Yeah, for your Here you go. Like, is it because it's a Chromebook? No, it's through the, it's through the software services. And one of the big ones is Newsla or something on News ELA. And the curriculum we use is partnered with Newsla. And so you can, any one of us can go on Newsla and find articles that are relevant to your curriculum. There's not a whole ton of them. You can't go find anything. But you can find something that'll work that you can adjust life cycle on. Oh, I was supposed to and well, with the move to e-texts, there is more likelihood that some of them are offering that. So some of them have been asking, because I know faculty at CSUN are writing e-texts, and they will say, we want it to be able to be adapted and have that differentiation aspect built in. I don't know about like your typical big publishers yet, but the more that our books become electronic, the more likelihood we have that. So it'll probably still be a couple years, but I bet that'll become a pretty typical thing. Huh? Go ahead, say. For English, Is it steady or study? Study, like you're studying. Okay. Synchronized. Study sync. Okay. Good. See, this is the kind of thing we want to get. This is our collaboration. We're sharing with each other and learning. What else about today? Um, let me ask the people who co-taught, did your lessons go exactly as you planned? Okay, I'm going to find out. Tell me why. Well, I thought they didn't go as planned for the time we were up there. So we didn't get through as much as we wanted. And as the lesson I planned, we kept wanting to add to the, and she kept up on a couple of new things. I'm like, you only have 15 minutes. She's like, I know, but I want to go over this. I said, see what we can get through. So I think yeah. we probably got maybe halfway through what we wanted to, which is okay. But we also tried something new a little yeah. bit, so that was hard. Yeah, we broke up into two smaller groups and did something you know, separately. But you know, the one thing also I wanted to mention that I we thought that the X 
activity would generate more participation from the special education students, and it did for half the ones that I wanted to. The other half were still on the outside, no matter how hard I tried, even in small groups, to get them to be part of a recorder or a measure or whatever goal they had. They still have a very, very difficult time, and I couldn't overcome that. That was kind of frustrating for me. Um, so I thought I had something going, and then I'm like, it's not getting them participating as much as I wanted to, so, you know. Why do you think that was? I don't know. I, I kept thinking, okay, maybe I need to isolate their role, uh, but that would have created the, the fluidness that I wanted with the rest of the, the groups. Um, but you said this was the first time you had used this particular configuration, um, or no? No, we already have the groups, we're already in small groups. Oh, okay. So the kids work together. Okay. The pairs were fours, and so they were already in fours, and they were working together. They just, I just didn't get two of the kids to, to fully accept the role that I wanted them to do. And then the other kids in that group weren't including them, too, so I thought it was a little bit of a both ways. Mm -hmm. Maybe I didn't set the activity up well enough, so it was all right. Mm -hmm. But could have been better for the spent kids. The Jenna kids took off on it, the high kids were fine, but I just didn't get the kids that wanted to. I like that, um, I like that there's this reflection, and, I, and that's why I asked the question, did anybody not go as well as you wanted to? Because we also need to take that, even if the lesson was great, even if I came in and observed and was like, I, I saw nothing wrong, every kid was perfect. The, this whole process, C time, is about continuous improvement. And it's about us always having something, but being able to narrow it down to what do we want to work on. So it could be that you guys reflect on this lesson, or um, how many of you filled out the two by two feedback forms? Hope some of you. Good, good, there's a few, good, good. That's to get feedback, and if that were something, maybe I was an outsider and I filled out and I could have said, you know, I noticed there was a kid in this group and he wasn't as engaged. Have you thought of blah, blah, blah? Even though you knew he wasn't engaged, you knew you've tried a million things. It could have been somebody from the outside giving you feedback that would have helped you go, oh wow, that's one, one of those four things is something I have not tried yet. And we need to be open to each other and giving feedback, and that could even be something where now that you guys have one thing that you really feel like, but we, we can't figure this out, we've tried a million things, you invite another team to come in for that purpose, just that purpose. It could be a 10 minute observation, that's what the C-Time does, the videotaping, is for just 10 minutes of observation on a specific competency. So that could be the competency you pick. Who else did a lesson that, and, and I want you guys to debrief, you guys were observed, weren't you? You haven't said anything. So I want to know, did it work as you wanted? Did it not? Explain. Yeah, we did a uh, upgraded uh, uh, lesson that we had actually developed about 10 years ago on uh, nuclear fusion inside of stars, specifically uh, what's going on inside of the sun. And uh, we actually upgraded it and made it uh, more challenging. Uh, we started out by saying, okay, this is what we used to do, but we're going to take this to more detail because you guys can get it. But uh, it went actually pretty well. And uh, our main objective was to get the concept of this is what's going on, this is this process, uh, and that's what the, the next generation science standards want us to do. Okay. But we took it to a deeper level, uh, especially for the uh, students that were capable of understanding it to a deeper level. But overall, uh, the impression we had was that uh, uh, all of our students pretty much got it. Eh, very little bit from class to class. Uh, mission accomplished, just if you were. Uh, and we gave some enrichment for those capable of, uh, of accepting it. Ah. And including discussions of isotopes and things like that. We're pretty happy about it. Um, it, uh, it was also nice to have uh, observers in the room. Uh, after the fact, uh, I know we, we've been talking here about, well, what did you see? What kind of feedback did you give us? And that's been quite valuable. A lot of questions about you know, how we got to where we are. That's good. Yeah, that reflection helps. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I forgot to mention the most important things. These were edible uh, objects that we were using. We were simulating uh, neutrons with uh, white marshmallows. Uh, I'm sorry, protons with white marshmallows. Um, pink marshmallows were neutrons. We were using uh, sour something or other for <laughs> neutrinos and something else for um, was that antimatter that uh, you know the antiprotons get uh, you know kicked out? Yeah, the gummy bears. Yeah, the gummy bears. <laughs> and, right? and then finally, for the energy that gets released, we were using uh, donut hole. So after after uh, we went through the whole thing, uh, we told them ahead of time you may not eat anything until you answer these questions. All right. Yeah. And so they were very eager. They're sitting there drooling. And, and uh, yes, we had gloves on. Once we're satisfied that they got the 
of material, you know, consistent with what the highest level they could get. So we said, okay, have a good time, enjoy. And it was like, you know, a feeding frenzy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Every once in a while, we would uh, ask someone who didn't have the right answer, someone who should have been able to. And we just said, I'll be back. And then the letter nice. was going, wait a minute, we want to eat this stuff. No, we'll be back. And they were yelling at us, come back, so we could ask them the same questions again, so they could eat the, you know, that's stuff. That's okay. great, yeah. yeah. That's built in motivation right there. <laughs> Donut holes and marshmallows. It, it literally was food for thought. <laughs> very nice, very nice. Anybody else for today? Has this process, at least hearing about it, whether or not you were there, has this process increased the chance? And I'm, I'm creating a question where I really hope I already have the answer. But has it increased the chance that you would be willing to have others observe you, either videotaped or in person, and give you feedback in your co-teaching? Most of you feel like you'd be comfortable with it? You're not comfortable with it? Are you still uncomfortable? I'm seeing some head nod. Okay, good. Thank you. Big head nod. Good. All right. Next year. Yeah. And, and by the way, so I, I do want to ask one question now. I want to uh, build this for the, the future. And I want everybody's opinion. So those of you who are um, not quite as engaged as I would like at this moment, if you would look up. Thank you. Thank you. Today and the last six times we've been together, and then you know one more time when you guys are coming together, has been about developing a community of practice. Has been about having you all learn not just from me but from each other about this various aspects. And when you guys came in, some of you knew nothing about co-teaching. I hope that's definitely increased. Some of you came in as veterans. I'd like to know what your opinion is for going forward. There's nothing on the books again other than the April 26th that we we said. But there's nothing that has to happen. No getting together, no big reunions, anything like that. But I want to know if there's a way, if you guys have a suggestion for a forum so that if you have questions for each other, if you want to share lesson plans, if you want to ask, hey, somebody want to come and observe because we have a rock star lesson plan next time, or we're having questions about how to differentiate in, in biology or US history or whatever. I don't know if it's a Padlet, I don't know if it's a blog, I don't know if it's a phone tree, I don't know if it's, you know, getting together for TGIF and having, you know, shots together, I don't know. Like, I don't know what would work for you guys, but what is, I don't know that that's an option either, let me just put that out. But what, what do you think, I mean, are we just done, in which case that might be fine, but I feel like there's enough of you and we're going to do some time where you're talking together again today in different groups that you would want to know that you know people at another high school. I know that Birmingham I'm going to be working with and I'm very excited. They're really ready to jump on. We're going to do a lot of training and in on-site observations and they're going to, um, I think it was, you guys were going to just take over Granada from now on, right? You're going to be the ones to look at. I don't know, there's a competition there somewhere. But, uh, but for the rest of you, some of you, you're just here with one or two other people or you might be alone. I mean, ha again, I'm just putting it out there. What would you guys like to see? You want some continuation and what could that look like? I see one then two, good. I want to get some ideas. I don't want this to be on me. I think if you continue this training next year, I would pull in other teachers to so like, hey, you need to come to this training, you know, and like I would grab my little teacher and have them here so they could like grab the same information. And then I will try to get not only like, you know, me, but uh, the person as well. So one option is there's some ongoing training and that would deal with a lot of money, logistics, things like that. But one is just having more training so that you guys can start preaching and saying, let me, let me bring in people, this is worth it. Sabina, what's another option? I think we were talking about maybe starting with a Google Classroom to kind of get different ideas yeah. to bounce off each other. And also going to observe other schools, just like, hey, can I watch your class for, you know, for a period? Because I think you learn a lot from your peers. Yes. I love that. Yeah, okay, so I heard a couple things there. One is a Google Classroom, so we could set that up so you guys could be involved in that. Another is you guys even just sharing emails and phone numbers with each other. If you've connected with somebody teaching something, the same content at a different school, you could just email each other and say, hey, can I, can I come observe you or will you come observe me? I think because your administrators have supported you coming here, or at least you could go and say, I've started this 
this growth process, could you support me by letting me out of the classroom, give me a sub for you know, a couple hours, let me go observe somewhere else. Maybe they would support it. What are some other ideas? Um, you know, Larry and I were talking perhaps in one of some workshops, especially if CSUN could sponsor it. Uh, we could ask questions about the location that doesn't necessarily have to be at CSUN. But um, although going online is, is always you know, can be very helpful, there's just something about the face to face that makes mm -hmm. a big difference. Okay. So uh, that, that could be something uh, that you know, we could explore. So I heard two things. Uh, one, I heard workshops, and the second, I heard make CSUN pay for it. <laughs> so, well done, um, now very, very nicely done. All right, well, and that's an option. What, not one my dean knows about, but it's an option. All right, what else? But certainly, I like the idea of maybe even having something that's a sort of a reunion workshop of let's share what have we learned from each other. Um, you know, where are we a year from now, or, or a few months next year from now? Other ideas? Are there any other things? Uh, feedback on those ideas? Can we just have like a website? Is that, was that already said? Yeah, no, no, that's what I'm asking about. Like yeah. a website or like a form that we, like the Padlet, kind of an idea where yeah. we paste ideas on there. Would Google Classroom allow us to do that? Is Google Classroom a situation where we would be allowed to have, like people posting, everybody posting, stuff like that? Okay. Are you volunteering to create one for us? Notice how I did that? He's making CSUN pay for workshops. I'm making you create the Google Classroom. You have a minute? Oh, you did. I'm so sorry. I was I just going to echo. We keep doing that to you. <laughs> That's the second time. Sorry. <laughs> I also like the idea of Google Classroom because it's already, it's kind of where we are during the day. So if we have an idea, we're all here. Uh, good. I mean, at least for you on campus, I don't know about other schools, but I just, like, for me personally, I think that's the one that makes the most sense. How many of you use Google Classroom? A lot. So that's a familiar technology. That would be a familiar site or, or you know, context. Okay. That's good. Yeah. Another idea. Thank you. I like that. Not to be a buzzkill, but um, unless it's changed, Google, uh, um, the way Google Classroom works is we all have to be part of the same domain. That's what I thought. Okay. Um, so if we're all on our own Google Classroom for education, it may not work. I, like yeah, I, I kind of wondered about that because I tried to create one for Google um, co-teaching coordinators nationally and I had to ditch it because they weren't on the same domain. But that, yeah, I don't know how we can do that. Maybe there's a way to trick it. Anybody know how to trick Google? No, <laughs> you do? Okay, good. <laughs> do you have an idea or you want to tell? You can be on well, it too, tell us. <laughs> groups, groups might be best. Okay. Uh, if, if you, groups kind of works the same way where you can post. Google groups? Um, yeah. Oh, okay. Like a forum. Um, so that might be more open. We, I'd have okay. to look in the settings. To Maybe you can, can help us. Up to more domains. Okay, cool. All right. All right, so that's something to keep going and, and try. But most people think this might be a good way to have something that's an online place that you guys think can keep collaborating, but also it sounds like a lot of people are interested in maybe having at least one or two ways to connect face to face. Yes? Okay, all right. All right, uh, where is Marty? I need him yet again. We're about to do food, but I have something that I wanted to announce. Sit right back there. All right, take, take a three minute brain break. If you have to stretch, whatever, take a three minute brain break before we. Uh... I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yeah. One, thank you. All right, so sorry, we're. My timing is off today. I feel like I'm trying to figure out because the food came, but it's not here, but it was going to be put out. So I'm just trying to figure out where to, to start, not to start. But um, a couple of things I want to announce. One is, I, again, not to be daunted, I created yet another pallet. <laughs> I'm just going to keep that sucker going. Um, I did put a few articles on it. So that's the new pallet. There's another um, uh, QR code if you want it. You can write that down but there's some more articles on it. Uh, one of the things I think I will do, if we do end up creating like a Google group or a Google Classroom or whatever, I'll take all the stuff from the different Padlets each week and I'll try and move them all over into one area so that you won't have to go into these different ones. But I felt like I needed to be consistent even though part of me just wanted to ditch that sucker. No, I, I, I've been like you and so I've tried it a couple times this year and just like it's not very good. 
So what I did that changed was, with my students in groups, I made it a group thing. So each group has to come up and post it. And then post it, yeah, yeah. So that worked really well. Then, then everybody got it. I've had, like I've done it at conferences where they were doing it, and then everybody posted it, and it's fine. It's this group where I feel like all I'm doing is I'm putting a couple things in and saying, oh, you guys, and it's so loosey-goosey. So I know perfectly well, I'm not giving the structure that would work for it, but dag blast it, I'm still going to create it. <laughs> no, I'm going to keep going. So anyway, so it is there, those of you who want it. Um, and I also really would like to um, announce two other things that are happening. If you guys, did everybody pick up one of these? Got this? Okay. This is one of the publications that the CTL puts out. Um, those of you on the mailing list will get this um, this week. But one of our doc students, and I'm actually the chair of her, uh, of her dissertation, she is doing research on a very, um, a very difficult situation. Uh, she's looking for families of what are called Menasua, this is really her name, they're not typically called that, but it stands for Middle Eastern North African Southwest Asian families who have students with special needs, students with disabilities, who have been in the special ed system or at least within the last 10 years. This population frequently does not uh, get involved in research and or um, identify themselves because often they are identified in census as white and so we don't, we can't parse out what's happening for these families. They come from often war torn countries. They've had all kinds of different experiences that we're trying to get in order to help their experiences to find out how can we be more culturally responsive. But also, frequently, they're the families who won't identify as having a child with a special need. So it's really hard to get this information. So the information on the study itself, it's an anonymous online study, but those people who fill it out um, can get a $10 gift card, so there's a little bonus there. Um, the information and the link is on the back. If you will, feel free to make copies of this and give it to all of your students because you may not know who comes from some of these countries. All the countries, or a bunch of the countries, are in the back, and they certainly include uh, Afghanistan, Algeria, Armenia, Egypt, Georgia, Libya, Morocco. I mean, there's tons of countries. So if you would help us by getting these out to your families, we'd be very, very grateful, even if just a couple of them fill it out. Um, and if anybody asks about translation, she's also willing to either translate herself, she speaks multiple languages, or pay for a translator. That's how much she's really trying to get this data collected. So um, if you guys will get this to your families, we'd be very, very grateful. Um, also, I, don't, I only brought a couple of them because I told you last time, but on April 3rd, which is Monday, uh, Dr. Scott Sampson is coming. And during the day, I'm really excited, I was telling my Vaughn teachers here that um, all of the middle school kids from Chime Charter all of them, 250 some odd kids, are going to be bused over to Vaughn. We're doing collaboration. And uh, to Vaughn Middle School. And Dr. Scott Sampson, who is the PBS host of the TV show um, Dinosaur Train. If any of you have kids, little kids, I watch Dinosaur Train. My kid, do you know Dinosaur Train? Yeah, but I don't watch it. But you know what it is, right? Okay, did you ever used to watch it? Yeah. When you were younger? Okay, it's a guy who's Dr. Scott, the paleontologist. He's coming. I'm very excited. My son's a you know, little dinosaur expert. So, um, so anyway, during the day, we're going to bring all these kids together to hear him talk about dinosaurs of the lost continent. And then in the evening, all of you are invited to CSUN. Please do register, sign up. But it's a free event, and he's going to talk about how to raise a wild child. And that's about getting kids away from screens and into nature. Uh, we're paying for him to come from Canada. He's supposed to be a great speaker. I'm really excited. So if you can come on Monday evening, free event at Cal State Northridge in the evening. All parents, all educators, welcome. So very, very exciting. All right, we are going to be breaking in a second, but our topic tonight, now before we break for lunch, I want us to just be thinking about the topic of assessment and co-assessing. And the thing I have on here is it's more than I'll grade mine and you grade yours. I have a question about what is the difference between grading and assessment? Because especially at the high school level, that becomes a big deal. What is the difference between grading and assessment? Um, to me, grading is just the process of going through and just checking answers, whereas assessment 
discussing is more reflecting on what those answers mean and kind of what the next steps are as an educator. Cool, excellent. Somebody else? Yes, good. Because this will be a big part of tonight's discussion. Um, for me, I recently, last school year, started doing standards-based grading. So for me, grading is very much just this thing I'm required to do by the district because the students need a letter grade and a GPA. Um, but for assessing, it's, it's me figuring out what the student knows and what they don't know and working on what I need to fill in the gaps. Yeah. Um, for, for their learning, Good. or what they need to work on, like that. Yeah. So standards-based assessment, she's finding out what do they know, what don't they know, what do I have to do as the teacher? But I like also that you mentioned that, I mean, right now we have a requirement. Based off where you teach, there is a requirement for grades. Do all schools in the United States require grades? No. no. And in fact, there's a movement away from grades. Some universities don't require grades. Uh, it makes it really difficult, and as a, a chain, that's going to be a hard one because we're all used to grades, but there's a definite movement away from grades as a letter grade and a GPA because we don't necessarily want to know what it means. We all know that there's great inflation in some places. We know that there's some people who include participation and some people who don't include participation. Some people who accommodate and some people who don't accommodate. So question of grading versus assessment. What are some of the issues related to grading versus assessment? What do you guys struggle with at the high school level? Okay, time. The grading seems to be. We were just discussing. We were just discussing this, but the grading seems to be the jury, and the assessing seems to be more of the activities and the fun and the projects and the ability to go and present. And I bet that, I, I love that description. So she said grading is more drudgery and the assessment is more of the activity and the learning. And I bet it, I think it feels like that as a teacher, right? If I feel like I have to go home and grade, uh, but if I'm thinking about did they learn it, did they not, what can I do to get it better? That's kind of exciting to me. I think it's the same thing for kids, right? If they feel like you're figuring out what they know in order to teach them, that's different than I'm gonna be graded on this. Just as a real, I'm coming over here, but just as a quick little um, story, I was doing a, a research study with kids, and I remember I went in, this was years ago, but I went into a kindergarten class and I said, hi guys, you know, I'm Dr. Morassi, but I'm not the doctor who gives shots, I'm the kind of doctor who has to give tests. And the kindergarten kids were like, yay! <laughs> like, what? But by first grade, they were like, oh, they didn't trust you, but like, it was, in one year, it went from, we don't care! <laughs> Good point. So once you have the grade, how many of you give options for kids to change grades? Do you have options? Now how do you do that? You don't get the question? Oh. <laughs> Um, so I get the option to retest, and I, Robin and I have, I, sort of, something like that also. Um, so for, for certain tests, students might have the option to come in and retake a different version of the same test. Um, and if they do that, um, we typically average their two grades together. Um, we've also sometimes done test correction, so they would have their original test that they took, and they would come in after school or at lunch, and um, they would look at the problems that they missed and give us kind of a written analysis of what went wrong and fix those problems, and that would also be a way for them to earn back half of those missing points. Okay. Others? Others who have different options? I don't think it's a different option. I'm not averse to giving a grade because they, if I go and look on a student's transcript, Great talk is talking about. Now you think, oh, they're learning well. It sort of gives me a, an idea that they could be a hard worker or they could have a high proficiency level. So it's a real 
snapshot, very quick snapshot of where your student has been and is currently. You could probably say there's some future, right, but I can see where this kid might be heading. But it sure is a very quick snapshot. Now it doesn't tell me what what they know. Probably not. Right. But it certainly is, like, like I said, just a real quick one page summary of like, you know, this student is okay. Or really well, or lots of decent things. <laughs> Something's wrong, yeah. So it may not say something intellectually about the kid, but it certainly is a quick, gives me some sort of idea of where the kid might be going right. or where they are. Right, and I like that you said it, it doesn't tell you why. So you, it's a gun You don't know if the student just had the aptitude, might be lazy, but is really smart and just threw it together, or is a hard worker. You don't know why they got the disease nips, but at least it gives you a snapshot. Others? Other options for the grading? I, again, this is going back to the grading sometimes is that one time thing, whereas the assessment is the ongoing thing. Do you have other options for grading versus assessment? Yeah. I'm going to be right back to you. Talk. Change the slide. I'm not currently doing this, but as a research teacher, um, I refer to our children, and I It's, it's something we have to keep, yeah, it's very hard to break apart. Okay, great. All right, well, so as we're going along today, and I, I flipped things a little bit. In the past, I gave kind of more, and then you guys engaged. What we're going to do after lunch, after dinner, whatever this is, um, is I'm actually going to pose some questions. Have you guys collaborate? Have you come up with ideas and stuff so that there's more time for that sharing out um, than we have in the past? Marty, I need your attention. Well done, sir. I like that. Um, I wanted to make one more announcement before I, are you guys about ready for, for dinner? Okay, one more announcement. And that is that um, I think some of you know, I've been working on a book and it is, it was sent to the publisher. I'm super excited. It's expected to come out in, thank you. It's expected to come out in September with ASCB. That's the Association of Supervision and Curriculum Development. And we have our final title. It's called Beyond Co-Teaching Basics, a data-driven, no-fail model for continuous improvement. So my partner, Wendy Lager, and I, and it's about the same time process. It's about how you collect data, how do you keep giving feedback, reflecting, and just continuing to improve. So we submitted it yesterday, and this is the dedication for our book. We dedicate this book to a group of superior co-teachers who have truly committed themselves to continuous improvement, the co-teachers at Granada Hills Charter High School in California. So I want you guys to give them a round of applause because for 10 years they have worked on this. 10 years. And then we added we would also like to highlight the support of administration at Granada Hills and give the most special shout out to Mr. Marty Eisen, the Granada Hills co-teacher coordinator. Mr. E has gone above and beyond to not only co-teach physics to students with significant disabilities, but also willingly. <laughs> willingly. I have that. It's fiction. Willingly pilot in sea time. And then this is fact. Gave hours and hours of support to his teams. Dude, you rock. So. We'll make sure you guys get a copy. And now I think we should take a break and get some dinner. Then we'll come back. <laughs> if you can hear my voice clap once, if you can hear my voice clap twice, and the rest of you, I'm sure, are still eating. All right, so here's what we're going to do as we continue. And again, feel free to 
keep eating some of this wonderful food. And again, thank you to, uh, to Marty for always getting the food and co coordinating all of this. He's not even here, but thank you. Oh, there he is. There you go. Uh, and also want to remind you guys that this is also because of a grant that Granada Hills wrote. Um, spent a lot of time and effort, and Joy Casper is one of the administrators here that spent a lot of time, Julia Howellman, and they did a lot of work to get this so that you guys would not only get paid to come, which is lovely because you're giving up your time in an evening, but also get some food and stuff like that. So it doesn't just come easily, it's a lot of work, but um, obviously I think we all appreciate it. So here's what I want to do, is just give you a couple things that the research has found as possible grading adaptations. They are going to be, in some of them, you guys will completely disagree or feel like no, that's never going to happen at my school. But there are at least ones that are out there. Now notice I'm talking about grading adaptations, which becomes much more contentious than assessment. Because assessment, if we say there's all these different ways you can differentiate assessment, I think we're all comfortable with, hey, sometimes we do paper pencil tests and sometimes it's a poster and sometimes it's this and that and that's fine. This is about grading. I'm going to front load you with these just for maybe five minutes and then I would like us to get in groups. My thought, and we can change this up, but my thought is if we do it by subject area, so again those of you who are more focused on English, math, social studies, science, because you can be talking about what you're teaching, how you're teaching it, how you grade it, et cetera. And I really would like us to be working across different schools. So it's not just you, the people from your department. This is really supposed to be about getting ideas from one another. So um, in terms of, somehow I'm having ring problems today. In terms of grading possibilities, uh, this is this uh, research, very old research at this point, but they've been doing some updated stuff and they're still finding that these are different options. I like this because it was, it was specifically for secondary and what they were doing is looking at different grading adaptations and saying what they liked or what they didn't like. So let me start from the bottom, what we don't like. Uniform passing grades. So those of you who have been teaching for a while might remember that there was a, a time, and tell me if you remember this, but there was a time when we were pretty much told in special education that if there's a kid and they're in general ed, they can't, fa you can't fail them. Does anybody remember that time? Okay, it was, it was kind of a thing, you can't fail them. And it very quickly got to the kids looking at you like, you can't fail me. <laughs> Which didn't help out. Matt, you remember that? Or were you going to say? No, I was saying I remember it. I don't know was, if it was one of those apocryphal stories or is it a Actually, was it actually? Oh, no, really, no, because I was a high school teacher when it happened, <laughs> so I know. Huh? You were just told that? Yeah, well, I'll change that next year. Don't worry. I'll fix you. I'll fix you. No, you, uh, that's ridiculous. <laughs> now, should we be feeling, no, we got to figure out what we're doing and what they're doing and why they're feeling, blah, blah, blah. But the idea that if you show up, you pass is ludicrous, and high school teachers were not okay with that. So uniform passing grades is not like a, not a good strategy. Just you show up, you're going to pass. The second was attendance and effort for the grade, not not embedded in the grade and part of it. But you know, again, you, you show up and you try, you get a grade. At elementary, it's a little different. As, as kids are little, we're trying to build habits. We're trying to let them know that yes, it does matter that you were in school. It does matter that you try. So we're building that. By the time they're in high school. That can be part of a grade should you decide to include it, but that should not be the whole grade. Right? So just, you know, you're in special ed, everybody passes, we don't like that, and the idea that you just showed up and you tried. There needs to be, a, like you guys were talking about the back standards, right? The standards-based assessment. There has to be something that they're going to show that they actually learned. So the bottom two were pretty much not for at all. The same thing with the, the third one, adjusting afterwards. Now this is another thing that happened, and some of you may still have this happen. You get a special ed teacher, and it's almost always special ed teacher, so I'm picking on my peeps. And what happens is a kid gets a, a D or an F. So I go in and I change the grade to a C because it wasn't fair because they didn't get, that gen ed teacher didn't allow the kid to get the accommodations to which he should have been entitled. So I just reactively, retroactively I should say, retroactively changed the grade. Has anybody ever seen that? It happens, a lot. 
and it's not good, obviously, because think about the co-teaching relationship. First of all, you know there's already a problem when somebody says, well, she wouldn't let me make accommodations. So there's already a collaboration issue right there, a communication issue. But the other thing is if I find out somebody goes behind my back and changes grades, we've got a problem. So that is also not a good option. Plus, let's think about what it's teaching kids. Right? All along, I fail, fail, fail. Everything you've given me, every test, every assignment, blah, 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 I fail, and I get my grade, and I've got a C minus. So wait. Right? Where did that come from? And we wonder why kids have no idea what the grading means. Okay? So we don't want that. Obviously, what we want to do is make sure that whatever we're giving them all along is appropriate so that the grade reflects the assessment. That make sense? Okay, so essentially you can take the bottom three and say in general these are not good. I, don't, I haven't seen any option where those three work. But the middle two, IEPs and contracts, those tend to be very appropriate but for individual learners. So these are not options that I would say I use as a whole class. But if I have a kid where I say specifically because of that child's disability, we're going to grade based off the IEP. We definitely see that with kids with more significant disabilities. But there are times when you can grade something based off an IEP even for a child with a mild to moderate disability. Okay, it would be something that everybody knows. This is what we're agreeing on. It could be just for some particular aspect of it. Or you're putting it into the grade because they're working on something. So it's not something I would do with the whole class. So we're grading on IEPs, okay? Contracts too, especially if I have a kid with a behavioral need. So if I have a student who has an emotional or behavioral disability, I may very well say to that student, okay, if you do this, this, and this, you get an A in the class. We have a contract for it. If you do this and this, you get a B. So it's very clearly lined out. Would I do that with every kid in my class? times five periods. <laughs> of course not. So again, those two, they're options. Not gonna use them very often, but they are, they, you can grade individual learners based off an IEP or based off a contract. The top three seem to be the ones that most of the people liked more often. Um, weighted work. This actually was one that I liked and I used it um, as a teacher in, uh, at Burroughs High School in Burbank and also um, when I was a teacher in Virginia. So the idea behind weighted work is I would talk to my general ed colleague, okay, my co-teacher. If the co my co-teacher said to me, all right, this is how I typically grade. 50% is on tests and quizzes. 30% is on our major project or unit for the semester. And then 20% is on homework and classwork. Okay, and that's the way they typically grade and that's what they want to do. Maybe I can have an inroads to change how we weight the work for the whole class, but maybe not. Maybe this person's entrenched and it's going to take me baby steps to make big changes. So instead what I would do is say, okay, if that's what the typical class is going to do, I'll go with it. But I've got a couple kids on my caseload and I happen to know they have such test anxiety and they do so poorly on tests that 50% tests and quizzes, I know right away they will stop. They're just going to fail. So instead, what I will do with those students is they're still going to take the tests and quizzes, they're still going to do the project, they'll still do the homework and classroom, just like everybody else. Maybe they have some combinations around the, you know, what we're doing, but in general, they're taking that. But the weight of the grade is different. That's, it's only math. It's super simple math. So then all I would do is maybe for, for these two learners, 50% of their grade is based off their classwork and homework. I mean, uh, yeah, classwork and homework. 20% or 30%, whatever I said before, is still on the unit, just like everybody else. But then it's you know a shorter amount that's based off of the homework. Right. Tests and quizzes. I'm getting confused. I'm confusing myself. Okay. All I do is change the amount, though. So tests and quizzes is now 20%. Project is 30%, and homework and classwork is 50%. Does that make sense? Does anybody not understand that? It's only that the grade is weighted now differently. Okay, so that's an option. I personally did that a few times. I liked it, it worked for me, and it helped parents when I met with them to say, look, here's what the syllabus says, here's an adapted version. So yes, your kid is still doing all the assignments that everybody else is doing, but the grade is just weighted a little differently. Okay, the next one up, improvement. 
Um, especially now in standards-based assessment, people have a much more difficult time with this one just conceptually, but this one has actually been supported in the research that if you ask a teacher, where did the kids start and where did they end up and what kind of grade is that? Like are they a B student, are they an A student, a C student? Almost every teacher can do that for every kid and their grades come out exactly. Like if you said at the beginning of the year you get to know a kid for a little bit and you say, yeah, that's a, a C plus student. They almost always end up with a C plus. <laughs> Happens a lot. So in this case, the idea of improvement is you're looking at each individual student as where did they start and where did they end up for them? Was this excellent A for them? It's about their improvement from where they started to where they ended as opposed to looking at everybody else. Okay, so that's another option. And then the very last one up there is another one that I've used really successfully. It's called process versus product. So I'll give you an example. I have two students. Uh, Shauna was a young lady who was, this was a ninth grader. She's really sweet, very sweet, um, and a hard worker, but also fairly slow. Um, she was very naive, very immature. She would wear, like, I remember unicorn t-shirts and she would want to braid my hair, which I never let her. Sometimes, but it's okay. All right, so Sean is super, super sweet. She would always try really hard, but she was never going to get the kind of outcomes that most of the other kids. And then I had Julian, and Julian was brilliant, absolutely brilliant, twice exceptional incredible behavior issues, um, identified as having ADHD and an emotional behavioral disability, but brilliant. So Julian, if I gave him an assignment, he could throw it together in minutes and then screw around for the rest of the period and drive me insane. So process versus product grade would mean I would say here's the assignment and you're getting a grade both on the process that you're putting into it and the product that you show me. So Julian might get an A for the product because it was it always met the standard. There's no question. He, I mean, he really was good, but he would spend five minutes on it and imagine what he could have done had he spent the whole period, right? So he would get an A on process, uh, product, but maybe an F on process. What would he get on the assignment? See, that's easy. So then Shauna would work her little tail off. She would be diligent the whole period. She'd work, 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 work. A on process, but the outcome was never all that great. So even if she got a D on the product, she ends up with a, yeah, maybe a C plus, maybe a B minus, I mean, it kind of depends, but I could look at that. The nice thing about process versus product is I could always talk to parents about it. I absolutely could justify why Julian got a C. And I could show, I am not taking away that he met the criteria, but he could have done far more and here's what happened and here's what we want to keep working on. So those are options. I'm not suggesting that any of these, is, this is, by the way, notice it was just how they rated them. It doesn't mean this is the best. It doesn't mean you guys need to use these. These were just options that were done in the research that secondary teachers were looking at. Uh, how do you quantify that, the process and the product? Uh, we have rubrics for everything. And, you know, and again, I think sometimes we can always make things fit the way we want. But we, you can have rubrics for process just like you can have rubrics for product. So you can do that and then you can, like I said, I, what I liked when I did it, and I didn't do it for everybody all the time, but there were times when I felt like I was so glad I was able to explain why that grade isn't just an automatic A or an automatic F or something like that. So, so we're good. We've got two more questions and then we're gonna, I'm going to let you guys just talk about it and discuss it. Go ahead. I didn't bring one with me, but does anybody else have process rubrics about where you put in, about when they're actually engaged in the process of like a, a unit or a product they're working on? Yeah, we can find one in 30 seconds. Go, yeah, pull it up. Okay, you're on it. She's, he's going to find a process rubric. There's, there's lots of stuff out there. Um, somebody else had their hand up. Yeah. So it sounds like in your example, you can buy process versus product with way to work. You gave them equal like 50% process, 50% product as part of their trade, right? <laughs> Right, well, for, okay, so they are, they're two definitely different things. In that example, yes, I, that example was a 50%, 50% process product, but it doesn't have to be. So you guys could also choose to say, all right, we're going to give 20% for process 
and 84% for product if you felt like it. The goal of all of this, you guys, is simply to realize that we do actually have some options in grading. I think most of the time we think we have tons of options in assessment, but not in grading. But we do have options in grading. And then for improvement, you noted like us doing standard-based grading, just how to negotiate that if you have any ideas. Yeah, and standard-based grading, again, as we go into it, that, I think somebody was mentioning how hard that is to actually assess, and rubrics seem to be the way everybody's going. Um, but this was just looking at a individual improvement, so you would look at them, assess them on the standard individually. However, they, and then say they move up like three, three levels, I, I don't, whatever the standard is, but say they move up, that's phenomenal, even if they started down here. So then maybe they're not meeting the same standard everybody else is, but for them, they just went up three levels. That could be an A for them. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. Any other questions? Again, I'm not advocating any of these. I'm merely putting these out there for you guys to discuss. Yes? Just to clarify, if Julian did his assignment, met the standards and got an A, which would be in five minutes, let's say, and didn't take all period. Would his assignment be graded to a C? Because so it would average. Right. Or would you grade him separately for the assignment and then his process? Right. So the question was about Julian. So on that particular example, the problem that I was having with Julian was that he, it, regardless of what assignment I gave him, he would throw something together, but he would then, he would, well, he would waste all his time and then throw something together. So rather than in the beginning, if he were just doing it and then I had all this time, maybe I could get him to do something else, he wasn't doing that. So in that scenario, that example, it was for that assignment, but I could say the product of the assignment and the process of the assignment. Because I had specific things I was trying to get them to do that I didn't feel like he was doing. In terms of what the assignment should be, I, there were times when the, the assignment also was enriched. So it was different than what I picked, but again, it was process that I was trying to work with him on that he wasn't doing. So that was targeted for him because of his behavior? Yes. Whole right, I wasn't doing this stuff with everybody, but that was for him, it wasn't, <laughs> we were working on process, not a good thing for him. And for Shauna, grading her on process helped her grade because she was so good at process, she just was lower at product. Okay, so here's your assignment with your groups. I am not. Oh, there we go, there you go. First of all, I want you guys thinking about the issues because this is, there are issues. Even with the things that I've talked about, some of you may say, well, no wait. Is everybody ready? Okay, thanks. So even with these options, and even if you're in the mindset that yes, we can do all these kinds of things, some of you may be in a situation where you're, you were told you have to grade like this. The department has agreed on one assessment and you will give it and there are no options. And you look like a creep if you say IEP trumps all, even though that's true, okay? So we don't want to do that, yes? I think this is one of the more controversial topics Very much in so. our own co-teaching cohort. Uh, we brought it up for multiple years and still struggle. Um, a lot of it has to do with like classes being connected to other classes. So if you're a math teacher, you are invested to help your student pass and have a skill set that will give them strength so they'll pass the next yeah. math class yeah. that they're moving on to. And, and there's, there's some level of meaning to that. And, and so that's been a challenge in our, uh, uh, in our cohorts. Um, and, and then there's the other flip side of that coin in which like, you know, does having an IEP, you know, because there are some kids in our, in our co-teaching environment who are so low, how can we get them to get that passing right. grade and, and trying to find a way for them to make some level of progress. Um, it, it's just tough. This, is, this, is, this issue of assessment is definitely our greatest challenge. Yeah, I, I completely agree. It's, it's really difficult and much more at the secondary level where now we're looking at this as a meaning toward your future. This as a meaning toward college. This is a, so that passing grade, is that doing them a favor? Is it not doing them a favor if they didn't have the skill? And, and what I'd add is, is that like, you know, there's some point at which 
you know, a high school diploma. What does that mean? And some, for some of our lowest diploma kids, right? The high school diploma might be all they can reach. And, and, and what do we have to do to get them to reach that? And it, it's, it's a real big challenge. Mm -hmm. We were just having that discussion about the two waiver. And I don't know what uh, Renata does about it, but they were just discussing how it's. Uh, I don't, I'll, let, I'll just leave it open. <laughs> but, but that's actually, but I'm glad because that's why I want you guys to get in subject specific groups because that way you math people can talk about that and say, is this, you know, is this working? Is it not? How do you use it? Is it well, if you applicable? Don't have enough, they were saying if they don't have enough skills to pass it, what do you do then? And um, like, especially if they're from SDC and now see, we have two SDC programs. I mean, uh, two, class, two grade levels that are SDC and then it's full inclusion for the other two. Mm -hmm. So now you're changing from an SDC math. Now you're required to do an Algebra 2 class. A pretty major jump. Yeah. Yeah. For, for Granada, we've talked about the waivers. It has been a discussion brought up. I believe it was brought up, correct me if I'm wrong, special educators two years ago. Yeah. And uh, we were kind of nervous about implementing those waivers because once we implement, you know, who's not going to jump on that boat, so to speak? You know what I mean? Like some kids might have the skill set but just don't want to push themselves to it you yeah. know and, and so we haven't implemented those waivers yet and that's something we're debating and talking about and discussing and i don't feel like we've come to a consensus well here i heard this other part is it more like just on the parents and then it is what it is at the end and then if he doesn't they don't pass well then they don't pass i, I don't know and, and then um yeah so that's all right, so guys, I'm going to stop this for a second because I think this is a great conversation for the math group. <laughs> because I want the, the English and social studies and science to do their stuff. Go ahead. I think there's also a push that um, it seems that everyone, they're now counting, there seems to be a counting of how many A's, how many B's, mm. and how many C's you have and then what are you doing for the D's and fails and we need to have a certain amount of these other grades and we're getting pushed that way now so how do you balance that if the kid really can't catch it or move ahead or doesn't understand right and we have a couple of kids that are very low and yet the parent is pushing that high school diploma, high school diploma, right. and you're like. And there's a couple things there. One is you guys getting pushed to have certain grades, right, by administration. Another is the parents and how they push you. And you guys, we're not even at a situation right now where our state is paying you by your student outcomes. Yeah. There are states where you are actually paid by that. So can you imagine? And and. Think about, so I can tell you because a, a very good friend of mine in Georgia, she, she, they had all these schools that had been moving toward being very inclusive and there was co-teaching and stuff. And all of a sudden when it's by pay by the student outcome, nobody wants a student with a disability or an English language learner. And all these teachers who were very philosophically inclusive were like, look, it has, it's nothing to do with collaborating. It's nothing to do with working with kids. It's my livelihood. The more kids I have who are low, the more kids take away my money. Can you imagine having absolutely no in, input into how you're going to get paid? It's crazy talk. But all right, so guys, here, let me just, because I want to make sure you have plenty of time to work in your groups. I'm just posing two major questions. One is, what are the issues? But please don't make it be just a gritch session, OK? We're not only just gritching about it. We also got to figure out what are strategies. What are things that you guys are doing? This is what the clo uh, community of practice is supposed to be about. Some of you are going to have different things that you've done for grading. Some of you have different things you've done for assessment to really help kids learn it. But I put up some general ideas, like even the co-assessing, what if you guys disagree? Are there ways you have communicated about your philosophy of grading or of assessing? Have you guys talked even logistical ideas of how you will grade? Are you hopefully not saying, I grade my kids, you grade yours, but what are you doing? Do both of you have access to grade books? Do you not? If not, what are you doing? Um, how are you differentiating for the assessment? And then other ways that you're supporting kids who, like we were just talking about, may be super low. 
what are you doing to help them out or to make sure they have the skills to move on? So it's assessing yourselves, it's assessing them, working together, et cetera. So issues, strategies. Uh, if you co-teach in the area of science, stand up. Science. <laughs> Got to get a few, that's, if you're going to, oh good, there's somebody else, good. Science, it's some more science. Good, okay, so Marty's right over there, so you guys go over there to start your conversation. All right, where is social studies? Any area of social studies, stand up. Stand up, social studies. You want science group, let's head over that way. Okay, there you go, go over that way. Go to Desmira. Desmira, you stay over there, and science will go over there. Social studies, uh, why don't you guys head back this corner? And then you can go anywhere you want, once we're broken up, but that way social studies knows to go together, social studies. English, where's English? If you're English, stand up. English, so we can see everybody, English. Good, English folks, come over here to this corner just to meet, and then eventually you can figure out where you want to go. English over here, math, math. Math may want to get into multiple groups, but Matt, why don't you meet in that back corner? Huh? You can break into as many groups as you want, but just different high schools, please. Yeah, different schools, guys. Different schools, please. Different schools. And then go anywhere you want. Looks like there's some coffee back there, so you can swing by the coffee on your way. I walked around, I didn't get to every group, but I did get to many of you, and there was some great conversations, lots of good questions, and a lot of different types of conversations. So, if I can get some of you to share out, what were some of your, your findings, or your questions, your conversations? What was going on in your groups? Yes. Thank you. Still a little confused, even as a special education teacher after 17 years, how you promotion as an issue. I heard quite a, yeah, I heard quite, a, I don't, I think it's a monkey, elephant, whatever the thing, it's, it's just a monkey in the room, it's not an elephant, okay, so it's a, it's a small animal. Um, but I think it's, I, what, I, I will address too, but what are some thoughts, what are some of your thoughts based on what Lee just asked? About the social promotion, about how you guys feel, especially those of you who are special educators. Yeah. She said summer school, but I, I remember I was teaching SEC and I, I found out that they went to summer school and I was like, how did you get graded? They're like, I did. And I was like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. they passed everything. So I, I also want to remind you what that research showed, that uniform passing grades, which is what Lee had started us with, is just that they just keep getting, you know, they're getting these grades. That was something we didn't like. Attendance and effort, we didn't like. So the research is support, we did not. Remember that was in the, the thing. The research doesn't like it, so we support, we being general research, nobody likes the idea that they just show up or that we just keep passing them. So what do we do? What are other things you guys were talking about related to this? I heard a lot of people talking about. Yeah. 
Oh, look, this time, I know, right? I'm coming to her. Um, we were talking about grading on a rubric. So um, instead of giving someone like a 0 to a 50 minus an F, you start at a 50. Okay. And it just helps with encouragement more for the kids who are failing. So instead of seeing like a 13%, which they can Never. They feel get like back. they can never get up to a 70, which they can't. Um, if they see it as like a 52 or a 56, that's more of an encouragement to like, oh, I can do this. It's only 4% up. Um, and it, I don't feel like it really skews that much grades, um, especially in the failing range. Like the kids who are getting a 13% are most likely still going to get an F, but it might boost their effort in the class overall. So those who have the potential to move up a little bit actually have a chance to do so. Go ahead, you had your hand up. Well, I think we're in the same group discussion, but um, I haven't run into it as much up here, but back east I ran into a lot of problems with parents who don't want their kids to necessarily get the skills because the, if they get their disability check, then mm. they can't. If they get a job, they lose their check. Mm -hmm. And if they lose their check, then they lose their money. So, you know what? I mean, I have had parents who would say, Johnny, second day of school, you go in, you beat up this kid, they'll suspend you, and they can only suspend you for so many days. And you just sit in school, and on the 15th of every month, I'll come pick you up, we'll come deposit your check, and you'll do that until the day you turn 22. I can game the system. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what state you were in, but I've experienced that in some of the states I've worked in. Um, and by the way, just has anybody listened to the um, or listened to the book? That's how I clearly I didn't read it, I listened to it. But uh, Hillbilly Elegy. Has anybody read that? Oh, just check it out. It's very interesting, but um, and doesn't specifically address that about the, the checks. But the idea of uh, working class poor and living with family members like grandparents and what's valued hillbilly elegy by J.D. Vance. Anyway, um, okay, let's go back to this question of the social promotion, the zeros, the um, uh, what do you do if they don't have the skill, even if they have an identified disability? Hillbilly elegy, E L L E. I'll put it on the padlet. Just to clarify something, we use the term. Social promotion. When that term is used, something comes to mind. But what is the exact definition we're using here? I don't know what we're saying. Okay, so so based off how Lee started this conversation, I oh thank you. Based off how Lee started this conversation, I was hearing different people talk about promotion and social promotion. I think we're talking about the kid does the minimum in terms of just physically being and turning in work, but the skill hasn't necessarily been attained. So there's nothing saying that the kid actually, whether it's standards-based assessment, curriculum-based measures, or anything, you can't say they have mastered or even met the minimum criteria of my content, and yet, because they have a disability or because they showed up, they're going to pass. Is this okay? Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's what we're talking about. The term that I have not heard in Invested or not. How does that fit? You guys, come on, this isn't just Wendy show. Here you go. Last summer I found out that the district has found a way to help those students. And the way they figured it would help them is if they go to summer school, we're going to ask teachers to make zero to twenty percent an F. 20 to 40 percent is a D. 40 to 60 is a C. 60 to 80 is a B. And 80 to 100 percent is an A. And so we've solved the problem. And so if the students take algebra to B, it validates with 41 percent. It validates all of their math high school requirements. Okay, we have a thing here. Uh, by the way, this reminds me very much of when we changed the definition of mental retardation, but three standard deviations below the norm to two, and bingo, we 
just magically made a whole lot of people not qualify for mental retardation just by changing a number. It was really awesome. I was so proud of us. That was years ago. Here you go. She was a good chair, but I'll just add, it's kind of how the state testing was working year, years ago, right? You know, proficiency levels were kind of matching that more than what we consider our standard A, B, C, S, et cetera, right? Uh, speaking as a math teacher, I just know that like with the validation, even though that exists, like oh I've passed the second semester of algebra two, and I think that also passed geometry and algebra one, you still need four semesters of math that you have passed in order to earn your diploma. So the validation does its job, but it still can't save them. So it really like, it can't be caught out. And when we use the term social promotion, it seems like the big thing is age, right? Because you get older, you keep on going, even though you haven't met the requirements for the course. And I think um, Mel had mentioned the question about are they invested? And I think all of us as teachers would say there's an aspect of subjectivity, even if we have rubrics, even if we have grades. If you know a kid is, is really working their butt off, like little Shauna, I mean, she, in every class, she was going to try, try, try. She was really trying. There was no way, honestly, no matter how you feel about me or not, there was no way I was going to let this girl fail. There was no way, because she was working so hard. She was always low. Now, on the other hand, if there was a kid who was low, who really was like, I don't care, I'm not trying, and I've done everything, and they're not trying, I'm probably not going to, as the teacher, put in as much to help either. And that is that right or wrong? I think it's whatever it is, but it is what it is. I think all of us know if the child is invested, we're really, we have a tendency to feel like, what can I do to make this work for you? Go ahead. The little Shauna show improvement. Little Shauna did show improvement. <laughs> like, I really appreciate the chart you have. The, the effort, the how much you invested, it seems like that's on the effort scale, right? Yeah. And if you move it to the improvement scale, it becomes the most important, the most helpful. Yeah, and, and absolutely she showed improvement. And I would have to say for her particularly, she would have met the minimum requirement. She was really, really low. And she was definitely one of the ones that parents said she doesn't have a disability. You know, parents were, compl you know, we had it. It doesn't matter. It's a long time ago. Here you go. <laughs> so this is something that's been going on for many decades. So we have a historical thing we can go. We, we can go on. This could be like a semester. Actually, I meant so, to tell you, you're now signed up. <laughs> Three unit course right here. Uh, historical context, we used to have Gen Ed math and sewer math. And then we went to the AG because everybody was going to go to college. Mm -hmm. So that takes care of some of the math deficiencies for choice. And it used to be before special ed, this is what D's were for, it was below average. And so teachers that had some compassion, they'd give somebody a D and they'd still get their diploma. Okay? And then we have a logistics problem. If we don't do social promotion, where are we going to help everybody? Are we going to have these huge people with these little people in junior high? And so I think that's something where they were, too many people were failing, so that was a solution. But in the social promotion, it's been a disaster from a lot of high school teachers' perspective. Because they come in and you tell the parent, you tell the student, you're not just going to be passed. But they think, well, I told that junior high. That's true. And so what do we do with the ones that don't want to be there or have the lower capacity? And so that's what we are trying to do while still hitting the standard. That's an interesting topic. Yeah, and you're right. The historical perspective is very nice. He had to win to. I just wanted to follow that up that, uh, you know, I'm very big talent. <laughs> and I passed my first grade it. with a nine back in El Salvador. But my family and my teacher decided to keep me in first grade mm -hmm. because I wasn't tall enough to be with the second graders <laughs> where they had students who had been, you know, retained. So it wasn't going to be safe for me to be with Wow. Them. So my mom said, well, at least give him a certificate. So <laughs> it feels accomplished. And I didn't repeat. 
Wow, I've never heard of that. I will say my son was playing soccer this weekend and I really am pretty convinced that one of the seventh graders was 28. <laughs> I mean, that kid was like, I don't know. Anyway, let's get one more here. Yeah. I was just saying with the social promotion, there's so much complex, like what Temple Grandin said in her talk at CSUN, where she would advocate to get rid of algebra measure of going to school. And we all know she's a brilliant brain. So had she, you, had we used the same measurement for her, she would not be who she is today. Nice. So then there's the issue of diploma versus certificated in our IEPs. Mm -hmm. So if we have a student on certificated track, why not pass that? Because that's what they're meeting the IEP goals. Then we have the eradication of vocational schools, which is what she mentioned, becomes an issue in society. So I think this is a root issue and not so much an education issue at all. That's a good point. Good. You guys, I hate stopping this conversation, although it's late. These are great conversations. Um, I want to point out, and I let this go this way because I felt like it needed to, we are having a lot of conversations about grades and assessment, but not in the context of co-teaching, just in general. Right? Just struggling with, it's about kids, certainly, and kids with special needs and kids not meeting that, for sure. Has nothing to do with co-teaching. All I would ask you to add in is on top of this layer of issues of grading and assessment, now add in the layer of what if you and your partner disagree. Now add in how do you guys logistically make that happen. We're not going to talk about it, just, you know, as you're driving home and obviously only reflecting on tonight, not thinking about anything else, while you're doing that, just be thinking about how, would I be able to communicate my own philosophy with a partner? How would I, how would we negotiate this kind of thing for students, okay? Because these are big, big issues and at secondary, middle school and high school, they're huge. So that is, I think, how we are going to end our, our sessions. I want to remind you it is April 26th. April 26th, Marty is going to send out I so feel like the teacher who, I, I dismiss you, not the bell. <laughs> the power. Um, Marty will be sending out an email asking you to sign up like he did for today's summit. So be thinking, talk to your administrators, look at April 26th. The idea is that we'll get you to go in and do some more observations and then also hopefully right afterwards have a debrief, a Q&A, a panel, or something like that. And then we will also, Marty and I will collaborate on what are some other potential options for getting this group together, both virtually, maybe in a Google group or something like that, but also maybe face-to-face -face next year. Do some, because our conversation at break was we don't, this, this could end up being a very superficial thing. We had lots of fun and you got some ideas, but how do we know if you learned anything? How do you know if you're applying anything? We would really like to be able to see you again next year to talk about, did this make a difference? Are you in a different co-teaching situation now or next year than you were this year? So that will be our goal. Please don't forget about the two plus two forums. And uh, really hope we can get a lot of uh, people coming in the 26th so that we can discuss ways that we can continue our, uh, here at Granada we've developed our communities of practice.